appreciate again you being here this morning. A little bit thinner crowd than there was last night, but uh, hope you get a lot, of, a lot out of the material that we're going to be presenting today. And we'll uh, start where we left off on this uh, trip through science versus uh, the evolutionary model. So evolution is the atheistic explanation for how the universe got here. And so if evolution can be shown to be uh, impossible, then some form of theism has to be right. It's the only logical possibility uh, with regard to the evidence for how the universe got here. And so there's several gaping chasms in the naturalistic perspective on how the universe got here uh, that require a blind faith for someone to be able to cross these chasms. Uh, we looked at the idea of theistic evolution and saw that that's not going to fit with the Bible, so it's either or. And a big point that I'm making over and over and over is how the naturalistic model requires certain things to have happened and yet there's no evidence for them and yet the naturalist still has to believe that those things can happen. So it's a pure blind faith. And so in our last two sessions we looked at some of those chasms like the laws of science. Where do the laws of science even come from if you don't have a God? How could a law write itself into existence and start governing the whole universe? We don't see that happening. And yet the naturalist has to believe it can and has happened. Uh, how can matter and energy come into existence before a supposed Big Bang, even if a Big Bang did happen, and yet the Big Bang has its own problems? And so we looked at three laws of science in particular in our last two sessions, the first and second laws of thermodynamics and the law of causality in order to study this subject and a summary of the implications of those laws is on the screen there, if you can see that well. And so in this session, I want to look at three other um, areas of science to see what they have to say about this question of naturalistic evolution. So the laws of science have been discovered through extensive scientific investigation of the evidence. They are, by definition, a... Uh, warranted conclusion from an, an, an inordinate amount of evidence. And so they are rational, uh, rational. And if anything can be said to be scientific, it would be the laws of science. And these laws of science present major unresolvable issues for the naturalistic evolutionary model, even though that is the dominant system being uh, pushed down our throats in our school systems, for example, and in our universities. The biblical creation model, again, is in perfect harmony with these laws of science and even predicts their effects based on statements that are made in Scripture. It is true, no one has directly observed God uh, with their senses. No one was there to witness the origin of the universe or the origin of life, to witness whether it was God or whether it was a Big Bang that started it all. Nobody was alive to see whether there was a flood. Uh, nobody has been alive long enough to directly witness firsthand whether or not Darwinian evolution actually happened. And so all of these matters are historical science. We look at the available evidence now to try to figure out what might have happened in the past. And we try to arrive at answers to these by examining indirect evidence. And I talked some about forensic science that uh, this is a whole area of science that is very much involved in this kind of study to figure out things that have happened in the past, what happened, when they happened, how they happened, in some cases why they happened without actually being there to directly witness these things. And similarly, studying our natural surroundings can tell us some things about the universe that demand a certain conclusion. And so the question that we're looking at specifically is, does naturalistic evolution fit the available evidence, or does it require a blind faith, an irrational faith, in order to accept that idea? So let's look at another area of science. Probability is intimately intertwined with science. Scientists um, constantly will study cause and effect, we talked about that last night, try to determine all of the factors that go into producing a certain effect, knowing that uh, we can't account for all factors, uh, we're just not omniscient, and since we can't get perfect uh, 
equations and, and account for every single factor. We oftentimes will have to rely on probabilities, and so we look at past results and get statistics and on those results so that we can figure out how likely it is that something will or will not happen. In other words, we determine probabilities. Mark Kack was a famous mathematician and professor at Cornell and Rockefeller universities, and he said probability is a cornerstone of all the sciences, and its daughter, the science of statistics, enters into all human activities, he said. And so evolutionists understand the significance of probability in science, and probability can be fine and good, uh, but the problem is evolutionists, in trying to defend their position, go too far in trying to apply probability and its laws to this question of evolution. Sometimes, or some scientists will argue that anything can happen if you just give it enough time, no matter how far-fetched and against common sense and intuition it is, as long as it doesn't have a probability of zero and has enough time to act. Uh, so they claim that science, uh, that since I evolu from a scientific perspective, since evolution supposedly doesn't have a probability of zero, they say, then as long as you give it enough time to do its work, it's going to happen. It's inevitable. And so supposedly, objects will pop into existence and eventually can grow the necessary components and come to life and just start strolling around with a little magic and sleight of hand, and then poof, eventually it'll even become a human. As long as those things don't have a probability of zero, and as long as you give enough time for it to have occurred, right? So then evolutionists have long cited the principles of probability, trying to find grounds to support naturalistic evolution. As far back as 1954, Nobel Prize uh, winner George Wald of Harvard, writing in Scientific American concerning abiogenesis. Abiogenesis is the idea that life can come from non-life, which would have to happen if evolution is true. And he said, however improbable we regard this event, right, life coming from non-life, or any of the steps it involves, given enough time, it'll almost certainly happen at least once. And for life as we know it, once may be enough. Time is the hero of the plot. Given so much time, the impossible becomes possible. The possible becomes probable, and the probable becomes virtually certain. One has only to wait. Time itself performs miracles. And there are at least four problems with that statement that, uh, that I talk about in, in this book. But let's go ahead and look at three of those very briefly. First of all, even if we were to concede that having an exorbitant amount of time could somehow allow for abiogenesis to happen, well, we still have a problem because there simply isn't that much time for it to have occurred. Uh, we never hear about this, but there's actually dozens of different scientific dating techniques from different areas of science based on standard evolutionary assumptions which point to a young Earth and young universe. And of course, we don't hear about those uh, because they don't support the atheistic evolutionary agenda. I have an article called 21 Reasons to Believe the Earth is Young that goes through a lot of that. You can see that on our website. But a second problem comes uh, in the form of um, some study done by Emile Borel. This is a renowned French mathematician. This is the guy they named the Borel Lunar Crater uh, after. In three books, he discussed in depth what he called the single law of chance, which states that events whose probability is extremely small never occur. At least he says, quote, we must act in all circumstances as if they were impossible. The law, he said, applies to the sort of events which, though its impossibility may not be rationally demonstrable, you may not be able to demonstrate that these events specifically are impossible. Um, however, okay, it's impossible. Okay, these events are, however, so unlikely that no sensible person will hesitate to declare it actually impossible. If someone affirmed having observed such an event, we would be sure that he is deceiving us or has himself been the victim of a fraud. <laughs> so strong words there. 
So there are some events that you couldn't directly prove to be impossible. Uh, you know, say uh, the boogeyman, okay? We can't directly prove that to be uh, impossible, maybe, depending on how you define the boogeyman. But sensible people will still consider it to be impossible. So a person might be able to calculate the probability of something ridiculous happening, but that doesn't really make it a possible thing uh, because our common sense and intuition has to play a role here. And we intuitively, as human beings, know that there are some things that simply won't happen and we treat them as such because we are sensible people. We disregard the whole probability question without a second thought. So Burrell tried to put a number on that idea. So what does he mean by events with extremely small probabilities don't occur? Well, so he gets, he gets specific in his books and he tries to put some skin on the, on the bones. And he, so he starts from the the human perspective, and he figures out what do typical human beings consider to be a probability that is negligible, okay, a probability that we would just say, this, this is never going to happen. And he tries to put a number on, on what human beings would consider to be an impossible event. So, for example, there is a possibility, a probability you could put on the idea of a few monkeys with scissors and dozens of magazines working away for weeks and weeks that they could cut out the necessary words and organize them in such a way as to perfectly reproduce the works of Shakespeare. Okay, so you could actually put a number on that and you give it a probability. Now, but we as humans, do we not know intuitively that that couldn't happen? This is not a matter of probability. It doesn't matter how much time you give it. Our common sense tells us the works of Shakespeare demand an intelligent uh, cause. So we know that a mind is necessary to create these works. So just because a person tries to calculate a probability of something ridiculous happening, that doesn't mean that it really could in reality happen. Uh, we have common sense, we have intuition, we know that there's some things that won't happen and we as sensible people treat them as such. We disregard their probabilities. Another example, there is a probability that you could put on the idea that if you locked an ape in a room and he's playing with a laptop computer, he could perfectly recreate the Encyclopedia Britannica by just randomly banging keys. Do you know you can put a probability on that? Uh, and, and does that mean that that would actually happen in reality? Could that happen? Okay, well, the evolutionist has to blindly and irrationally say, well, you know, it could occur. And so evolution could happen because of that. Well, believe it or not, researchers at Plymouth University in England conducted a test with six Sulawesi crested macaques, uh, like these guys on the screen. And their goal was to figure out, you know, what, what will happen if you put six apes alone with a computer? Their names were Elmo, Gum, Heather, Holly, Mistletoe, and Rowan. All right, you think that they uh, made just one Shakespeare book? How about just, you think maybe uh, a page? Maybe they accidentally just got one page? <laughs> no. How about a paragraph? Is that likely? Just a single paragraph? <laughs> no. A sentence? I mean, sure, they at least got one word on accident, right? According to Mike Phillips, one of the researchers, the first thing that happened was the lead male got a stone and started bashing the computer, right? All right, now that's what our common sense tells us is going to happen. And uh, they also were interested in uh, marking the keyboard as their territory, okay? So, so this is, again, what you would expect to happen. We have common sense that tells us these guys are not going to be able to recreate Shakespeare. And it doesn't matter how much time you give them, and it doesn't matter what you say the odds are. Uh, they did finally produce five pages of text, primarily composed of the letter S and A, J, L, and M from time to time. Uh, Mike Phillips said, well, you know, they pressed a lot of S's. Obviously, English isn't their first language. <laughs> but honestly, again, uh, wouldn't we expect results like that? Our common sense tells us that. This is not a matter of probability. There's some things that just won't occur. It doesn't matter how much time you give, no matter what you say the odds are. And so Burrell tried to quantify 
that type event. And so he determined the probability of those events that any typical reasonable individual would consider to be impossible. And then he stepped back and and mathematically extrapolated what the probability of those kind of events would be from an entire earthly perspective rather than just the individual. And then he extrapolated it for the entire universe. So cosmic events that would fall under the single law of chance. So ultimately concerning those kind of events, he argues using mathematics that humans consider probabilities of chance cosmic events that are less in one to the t- one in ten to the forty-fifth power to be impossible. All right. So this is arrived at by a renowned mathematician and evolutionist. All right. So in other words, if the probability of a certain event happening in the universe is less than one in ten to the forty-fifth power, a one with forty-five zeros after it, intuition tells a sensible human being to categorize that event as so unlikely that it should be considered impossible and should not be given any consideration or attention. All right, now here's the problem. If naturalistic evolution is true, then abiogenesis must be true. So life had to come from non-life, spontaneous generation. Okay, so how does that play in here? Well, evolution is Harold Marowitz of Yale University, uh, currently professor of biology and natural philosophy at George Mason. He estimated the probability of the formation of the smallest, simplest living organism to be one in 10 to the 340 millionth power. Okay, so according to the single law of chance, that is a probability so far under what should be considered negligible that you really can't fathom this. The implication from the single law of chance is that the random chance formation of the smallest, simplest living organism in the universe somewhere just would not occur, and it's not worthy of our attention if we're sensible. According to Burrell, a sensible person will disregard this possibility and consider it to be an impossible event. One in 10 to the negative 45th power, there's your top number. The bottom number is just one in 10 to the negative 1,000th power. You have to add another 340,000 sets of that many zeros to get that probability. And this is the estimation of the probability of the formation of just the smallest, simplest living organism according to evolutionist Harold Marwitz of Yale University. Sound like a pretty slim chance to you? How about this? The late renowned evolutionist Carl Sagan made his own estimation of the chance that life could evolve on any given single planet, one in 10 to the two billionth power. Okay, so that is two million sets of that many zeros. And what's more, you have to keep in mind that these calculations were made before much of the more recent research that reveals with even more clarity the complexity of life. So again, these probability estimations for the formation of life made by evolutionists themselves are so far beyond the limit that Burrell stated for cosmic events that really it's not even funny. It's shocking because the creation model has been considered a hokey by the scientific community, even though it's the logical conclusion from the evidence. Naturalistic evolution is far-fetched and mystical. It's witchcraft without a witch. Uh, Common sense, intuition, reason, mathematics all point to the conclusion that naturalistic evolution and therefore atheism are not possible, even granting their own assumptions. Sir Frederick Hoyle was a distinguished atheistic British astronomer. This is the guy that actually coined the term Big Bang. He said the chance that higher forms have emerged in this way is comparable with the chance that a tornado sweeping through a junkyard might assemble a Boeing 747 from the materials therein. That's the kind of probability we're talking about. He further said, at all events, anyone with even a nodding acquaintance with the Rubik's Cube will concede the near impossibility of a solution being obtained by a blind person moving the cubic faces at random, right? We concede that. A blind person, you're just randomly moving the the block, and uh, and then they get a solution of the Rubik's Cube. Okay, that's already, okay, I don't know about that. All right, now, imagine 10 to the 50th power blind persons, each with a scrambled Rubik's Cube, and try to conceive of the chance of them all Okay, not just doing it, but simultaneously arriving at the solved form. 
right? Because all these have to be done at the same time. You then have the chance of arriving by random shuffling of just one of the many biopolymers on which life depends. The notion that not only biopolymers, but the operating program of a living cell could be arrived at by chance in a primordial organic soup here on the earth is evidently nonsense of a high order. The simultaneous placing of all the necessary pieces of the puzzle to form only one of life's biopolymers through blind chance, random accidents, as well as the program that controls that cell, according to this famous scientist and evolutionist, that, that's nonsense. Science simply doesn't support that fairy tale scenario. You have to believe blindly in superstition. No wonder Richard Dawkins, writing in New Scientist, he said, the more statistically improbable a thing is, the less we can believe that it just happened by blind chance. Superficially, the obvious alternative to chance is an intelligent designer. Now, he, of course, rejects that obvious alternative and blindly continues to hold on to atheism. But he at least admits that common sense tells the sensible human being that blind chance can't account for what we see when we're talking about these kinds of odds. The designer is obvious. Now, there's an important um, addendum that I want to attach to this discussion, because in actuality, even talking about these probabilities, it can be misleading if you're not paying close attention. By even discussing it, I could leave the impression that I think there is a minute possibility of, of abiogenesis happening, however ridiculously small that chance might be. So whenever I give these numbers about apes or talk about there being a probability for these apes cutting scraps from magazines and making the works of Shakespeare and so forth, probabilities can be calculated for those events, small though they may be, because there is, for example, an input device, a keyboard for the computer. And therefore, there's a chance that the ape will just happen to want to stay there in front of the computer and bang on the keyboard. Now, really, the evolutionary model is not a direct parallel to that. Why? Well, because the evolutionary model would be more like the ape being in a room with a computer, but there's really no keyboard for the computer. Okay, so there's no scientific evidence that supports the belief that something physical could exist forever or just pop into existence, that life could come from non-life, that one kind of creature, say a dinosaur, could totally morph into a totally different other kind of creature, that scientific laws could create themselves from nothing. And there's dozens of these kind of examples, all of which must be true in order for naturalistic evolution to be valid. In other words, for the evolutionary model, there's no keyboard for the ape to even punch. And really, it's worse than that, isn't it? <laughs> there's not a computer. In fact, there's not even an ape. <laughs> there's nothing. The room's empty. The naturalistic model, which rejects God, starts with nothing in the room and claims that the works of Shakespeare could eventually come about. Okay, now how can the probab probability be calculated on nothing? So we're really not talking about probability here. Evolution is not a matter of probability. It's a matter of impossibility. How could a non-existent ape replicate an, ency an encyclopedia on a non-existent computer with a non-existent keyboard? This isn't just improbable. It's not possible. How could evolution start with nothing, as well as no means of getting anything, and still end up with everything? You know, it's not like they've got a little bit of evidence that would back the idea, oh, well, that could, that could happen, just give it a little bit of time. That at least would get you going, moving in a certain direction. You've got some evidence to support your hypothesis, but that's not what they have. Instead of any supporting evidence, oh, there's a lot of evidence, all right, but it's all to the contrary of that. Not only is there no evidence that could be used to support the idea that life could come from non-life, there's a ton of evidence that says that can't happen in nature. And since there's zero evidence that such a thing could happen, then according to the evidence, there's a zero probability of it happening. And that brings us to what is called Komogorov's first, uh, first axiom. Right? This is the third problem with the statement that evolution is inevitable given enough time. And according to this probabilistic rule, when the probability of an event is zero, we define the event as an impossible event. So you've got to keep in mind that all probabilities do is try to find trends that have been observed to occur when we study nature, like uh, 
studying what happens every time you um, uh, plant a seed or something like that, okay? So that we, we can calculate some probabilities on things as we observe them happening. So if there's an event that has never been shown to be able to occur in nature, like the spontaneous generation of matter and energy or life, then that event stands as having a zero probability. You can't just wave your hands and assign a probability to something that science has repeatedly proven to be impossible. You know, it's not like the spontaneous generation of life has been shown to be able to occur in a laboratory one time in three million tries. Okay, well now you, you've got a probability, you've got something to work with. But that's not what science has shown. There is no evidence to support a probability of anything other than zero for several evolutionary events that are necessary if it's true. And since several events that are necessary to be true have a probability of zero, then according to the laws of probability, these atheistic theories are impossible. So even if time could actually help in the process, which it can't, the time isn't available Plus, the single law of chance prohibits several evolutionary events, and Kalmogorov's first axiom tells us these evolutionary events are actually defined as impossible events. So probability does not support naturalistic evolution. Once again, the biblical creation model doesn't have a problem with the evidence on this, because we don't need to have a causeless leap from nothing to everything and from non-life to life. That's superstitious silliness. Since a naturalistic explanation is not in harmony with the statistical evidence, a supernatural explanation is demanded by the evidence, which is what we believe happened. If the God of the Bible exists, then there's a 100% chance they created the universe and life. No probabilistic rule violated. All right, what about, what about the well-known, highly respected law of biogenesis? This describes, again, as we watch nature and see how it works, we see this is what happens with life, where life comes from. So if, in order for naturalism, again, to be true, the atheist has to have an explanation for how you get life from non-life. So if they accept the Big Bang and so forth, there's no life then. At some point, you have to have the non-living stuff come alive. Uh, so ultimately, in the evolutionary model, life had to come into existence from these non-living substances. So for millennia, up to a few hundred years ago, it was a common superstitious belief that life could, in fact, spring into existence from non-life, just come into existence, a belief known, again, as spontaneous generation or abiogenesis. Then in the 1600s, Italian scientist Francesco Ridi conducted scientific tests that cast serious doubt on the idea of spontaneous generation. Some were still skeptical of his experiments and, and thought abiogenesis maybe still could occur. And so Lazzaro Spallanzani conducted his own test to investigate the criticisms of the skeptics. And he further substantiated the fact that abiogenesis does not occur. Rather, life comes only from life. Still many were skeptical. Then in 1864, French scientist Louis Pasteur uh, developed experiments to, uh, that drove nails into the coffin of this whole idea. In one standard uh, high school biology textbook, it's evolution-based, mind you. It says it wasn't until 1864 in the elegant experiment of French scientist Louis Pasteur that the hypothesis of spontaneous generation was finally disproved. Pasteur, like Reedy and Spallanzani before him, had shown that life comes only from life. Now notice, people used to believe in the superstitious idea that life could spring into existence from non-life. And textbooks have long championed the work of Pasteur because he did real science and showed that such a ridiculous superstitious idea is just silliness, and yet now what do we have? We've come full circle, and now it's not so superstitious and ridiculous anymore. It's considered a legitimate possibility, even though there's less evidence now than they thought they had a thousand years ago. Life comes only from life, and even the evolutionists concede that, although they, they admit it begrudgingly. The fact that life comes only from life is what we call the law of biogenesis. So with that knowledge, the best that the naturalistic evolutionists can do is try to prove that abiogenesis still could happen if we just figure out a circumstance that would make it happen, and in spite of all the evidence against it. So all kinds of scientific experimentation and gathered ideas, um, gathered data from Reedy, Spallanzani, Pasteur, scientists never having observed any exception to the rule, and yet they just refuse to accept the, the warranted conclusion from the evidence. So what are they being? 
irrational. And instead, they pour endless hours and, and mounds of money into trying to get it around the, you know, is, wouldn't it be amazing? Imagine how much more could be done in science if we didn't have so many scientists chasing these wild, going on these wild goose chases, wasting that time and money and manpower on these ridiculous ideas. They're just ignoring the God option. Don't even consider that a possibility. It just shows their blindness over this issue. So, you know, again, is this a reasonable approach? There's been a stream of attempts to try to find evidence that life could come from life, try to find evidence to substantiate that idea. And these attempts, without exception, have not shown that life can come from non-life, but rather that in nature, life comes only from life and that of its kind. And there is no exceptions to this. Thus, biogenesis is a law. And the implication is abiogenesis is not possible if you want to be rational. Martin Moe, who was a prominent marine biologist and evolutionist, he said, a century of sensational discoveries in the biological sciences has taught us that life arises only from life. Uh, evolutionist uh, George um, uh, Gaylord Simpson, perhaps the most influential paleontologist of the 20th century, he said, there is no serious doubt that biogenesis is the rule, that life comes only from other life and uh, uh, that a cell, the unit of life, is always and exclusively the product or offspring of another cell. Uh, in the biology textbook, Biology, A Search for Order and Complexity, Moore and Slusher wrote, historically, the point of view that life comes only from life has been so well established through the facts revealed by experiment that it is called the law of biogenesis. So what does the actual scientific evidence indicate about the origin of life? Well, life comes from life. And even the evolutionists, like these guys, acknowledge that, and yet they refuse to accept the implications. If naturalistic evolution is true, abiogenesis must be possible in spite of the evidence. So belief in abiogenesis is a stubborn refusal to accept the scientific evidence and choosing instead to believe in evolutionary superstition, myths, and fables, fairy tales. All right, so in light of the extensive amount of scientific evidence against abiogenesis, how can the theory of evolution be given any credence, any attention? How do they respond to the evidence against abiogenesis? Amazingly, one typical response is for them to just come out and admit, come out and concede, it can't happen. Life cannot come from non-life because we're rational. They have to come out and acknowledge that. They just admit it. Uh, George Wald, who I quoted earlier, Nobel Prize winner of Harvard, notice what he said, one has only to contemplate the magnitude of this task, life coming from non-life, to concede that the spontaneous generation of a living organism is impossible. Yet here we are, as a result, I believe, of spontaneous generation. So he still believes it anyway, but what kind of belief is it? It's a blind belief. It's not based on evidence. See, this question of evolution versus creation is not about the evidence. The evidence clearly favors the biblical perspective. It shows you what's really going on here. This isn't about the evidence. Life can't come from non-life. It's impossible, but I just won't believe in God. So abiogenesis must have happened. That's not rational. It's common for high school biology textbooks to just come out and admit spontaneous generation is impossible. It was disproved. Like this one, the hypothesis of spontaneous generation was finally disproved. They then proceed literally on the next page to promote evolution and the origin of life from non-life. Every biology textbook that I had studied over the last uh, few decades showed the work of Pasteur and how he disproved abiogenesis and it was this shining moment for science. And then finally, I found a textbook that removed Pasteur's work. The 2010 edition of this very textbook eliminated the discussion entirely. And so I went ahead and contacted uh, Miller and Levine and said, what's up? Why'd you guys pull the Pasteur work? That's good science. All right, and uh, I think it was Levine that wrote back and he said, well, yeah, I mean, it is good science, but we've got so much other stuff to include in there that we just, you know, we can't put everything in there. That was, that was Miller's chapter, and so that was his choice. He left that out. And, well, I tell you, I think I know why they pulled it. 
because it so conclusively disproves naturalistic evolution. You can't keep that topic in a biology textbook and then promote naturalistic evolution. That's why the numbers have held at about 46%, 40 to 46% of people that still in our country refuse to accept naturalistic evolution and still concede that the earth is young and evolution is false. You're gonna to have to pull that discussion to Pasteur if you're gonna change that. It stayed the same for so many decades. So Frederick Hoyle, again, who coined the term Big Bang and his colleague Chandra Wickramasinghe, professor of astronomy and applied mathematics at University College in Wales, here's what they said, the probability of life originating at random is so utterly minuscule as to make the random concept absurd. <laughs> right? uh, J.D. Bernal, who was a leading uh, scientist among the X-ray crystallographers of the 20th century, he said, it is possible to demonstrate effectively. We can demonstrate this in a lab, how life could not have arisen. The improbabilities are too great. The chances of the emergence of life too small. Regrettably, from this point of view, life is here on Earth. And the arguments have to be bent around to support its existence. Okay, is that being rational? I mean, is that allowing the evidence to force you to draw a conclusion? Evolution has to be true because we just won't accept creation, and so we'll just have to bend the arguments to make it possible. No wonder the McGraw-Hill Dictionary of Scientific and Technical Terms actually defines abiogenesis as the obsolete concept that plant and animal life arise from non-living organic matter. All right, now if apogenesis is impossible, if such, a, if such a belief is considered obsolete, then how could evolution still be considered credible by the majority of our country and the bulk of the uh, standard community today among scientists? How did life get here without it? When pressed for an answer to, these, to this question, many evolutionists literally throw their hands up and admit, we don't, we don't know, we don't have a clue. The late evolutionist John Maddox writing in Nature, uh, the Nature Journal, he said, it's disappointing that the origin of the genetic code is still as obscure as the origin of life itself. So notice he recognized not only do we not know where life came from, we now know it's actually more complicated than that because how do you get the genetic code? Robert Hazen, evolutionary geologist of Harvard, notice the source for this quote, the origins of life. This is a this is a, a lecture series he did on the origins of life, right, from a naturalistic perspective. But notice what he says right up front. The origin of life is a subject of immense complexity, and I have to tell you right up front, we don't know how life began. How can I tell you about the origin of life when we're so woefully ignorant of that history? All right, now that is a really good question. So students, that's when you stand up and you walk out of the room. This is a waste of your time because the rest of the course is going to be giving you a bunch of conjecture and speculation based on the blind faith that naturalistic evolution is true. It's going to be packaged in a way that makes you feel like, well, it must be true. I mean, this guy's got big credentials and so forth, and he's saying it so confidently, and he's not going to expose for you these major problems with it. That's the way it's always been. Error is always packaged in a way where it makes you want to believe it. It's the way it's always been. Paul Davies, theoretical physicist, cosmologist, astrobiologist, Arizona State University, writing in New Scientist, he said, one of the great outstanding scientific mysteries is the origin of life. How did it happen? The truth is, nobody has a clue. Richard Dawkins, in a 2008 documentary uh, with um, Ben Stein, he discussed the origin of life. Dawkins said, you know, how did life get started? Nobody knows how it got started. We know the kind of event that it must have been. We know the sort of event that it must, that must have happened for the origin of life. It was the origin of the first self-replicating molecule. All right, think about that for a moment. What happens to the first life if it can't replicate? It dies, right? Okay, so now it's even more complicated. You've got to somehow get life from non-life. It has to have a genetic code. It has to be able to replicate itself. Okay, this is a major problem. All right, and so he says, okay, well, we don't know uh, how this happened, but we know it had to be able to replicate itself. Okay, yeah, I'm with you. Okay, so Stein says, all right, how did that happen? Dawkins said, I've told you, we don't know. Stein says, you have no idea how it started? No, nor has anybody. All right, 
Of course you don't know how that could happen because it's been scientifically shown that it can't happen in any natural way. So naturalistic evolution cannot happen, and yet he's an evolutionary biologist. He spent, he got a PhD in this. That, it's the equivalent of getting a PhD in boogeymanology. Okay? You know more than anybody else about the boogeyman, but the boogeyman doesn't exist. So he wasted his time. And he doesn't even know how his whole thing could get started, his whole belief. And he still believes it anyway. An extremely prominent evolutionist, considered maybe the leader in the field. He admits nobody has a clue. So they're not being able to create life in a lab. Nobody has a clue how it can happen. To all intents and purposes, it's been shown to be impossible. So what are they, what are they left with? Well, a, a response that some of them are saying, this is actually more recent. They didn't used to try to say this. They now try to dodge it, don't even face it. They'll just say, well, the origin of life is irrelevant to evolution because the theory of evolution s starts with life already in existence, all right? So we don't need to worry about how it got there. We're just looking at what happens after it gets there. And I address that much more in depth in my book, but briefly think about this. That dodge only helps you if you're a theistic evolutionist. You don't need to know that if you're a theistic evolutionist because God can jump in there and do it. But evolution is a naturalistic theory. You've got to have an explanation for that if evolution is true. We've already shown theistic evolution can't work. Now, if you're a theistic evolutionist, if you believe in God, then why in the world would you try to kick him out of the science classroom, which is what they've done? So in truth, it's the naturalist who's trying to kick God out of the classroom, and the theory of evolution is the naturalist theory. Evolution was designed to be a naturalistic explanation, and so you have to know where life come from, came from. And that's why historically, abiogenesis has been understood by evolutionists to be an acknowledged fundamental assumption of evolution, even though they don't know how it could happen. Years ago, Gerald A. Kirkut, British zoologist and physiologist at Cambridge, he listed seven assumptions that are non-provable that evolution is based on, okay? And the first one, the first assumption is that non-living things gave rise to living material, i.e. spontaneous generation occur. They've always acknowledged this is just something that, we, that happened. We don't know how, but if evolution is true, then this is something that had to have occurred. Otherwise, how do you evolve something if it's not even alive yet? So the problem can't be dodged. The evidence doesn't support naturalism. It's an unscientific idea. All right, well, what are they left with? How do you get life started on earth if you don't have God? Interpanspermia, directed panspermia. You know, if you give it a fancy name like that that nobody has any idea what it means, then it's like, oh, okay, well, yeah, that explains it. That's pretty much where we're at. So in order to come up with an answer to the abiogenesis problem without resorting to God, we have many scientists that are leave, literally leaving the planet. There is a growing belief in the idea that aliens brought life here and seeded it billions of years ago and that have directed the evolution of life since then. I mean, after all, if evolution is true, remember, it would be inconceivable for there not to be aliens somewhere out there. Remember, that's the Fermi paradox. We talked about that with the Big Bang. Star Trek relies on that and explores it. Again, for Frederick Hoyle and his colleague, Professor Chandra Wickramasinghe, remember, they, Hoyle has some great stuff on how life can't come from non-life. He, you know, he makes great points. Man, this can't happen. So instead, he accepted aliens. That's where he went with it. He said, you've got to have some kind of creator because this can't happen on its own. So they'll do anything to avoid the idea of God. Guess how much evidence there is of extraterrestrial life? Zero. If you believe that, and you're free to believe it, it's an irrational blind faith if you do. Okay, you just got to accept that because there's no evidence for it. Now, if you believe staunchly in naturalistic evolution, then it has to be true. But is naturalistic evolution true? That's the question. There's no evidence for extraterrestrial life. It's pure speculation and wishful blind faith thinking for the naturalist to resort to that. That's why evolutionary astrophysicist and astronomy journalist Stuart Clark said concerning the alien seeding theory, its probability is so remote it should be left aside, and yet evolutionists are still buying into the idea because what do they have left? What are the other options? 
In that documentary with Richard Dawkins and Ben Stein, um, Dawkins talked about the possibility of intelligent design. Notice what he said. It could be that at some earlier time, somewhere in the universe, a civilization evolved by probably some kind of Darwinian means to a very, very high level of technology and designed a form of life that they seeded onto perhaps this planet. Now that's a possibility and an intriguing possibility. And I suppose it's possible that you might find evidence for that if you look at the details of our chemistry, molecular biology. You might find a signature of some kind of designer and that designer could well be a higher intelligence from elsewhere in the universe. All right, now wait a minute here. Before we go any further, Dawkins, one of the most famous atheists of our day, admits, okay, you know, maybe there is evidence of design in our body. Wait a minute. We've been saying that for millennia. <laughs> they don't want to have to concede that because if you have design, there must be a designer. That's your teleological argument for the existence of God. He actually concedes the possibility of God by making that statement. Now, granted, he flat out rejects the idea that it's the God of the Bible, and instead he accepts aliens. There's no evidence for aliens. There is evidence for the God of the Bible because we have a book that has supernatural characteristics that humans could not have produced. There's no evidence for aliens. This illustrates the prejudice that many have against God. Now, amazingly, notice what Dawkins said about those aliens. That higher intelligence would itself had to have come about by some ultimately explicable process. It couldn't have just jumped into existence spontaneously. All right, now wait a minute. According to Dawkins, our supposed alien creators have been strapped with the laws of nature too. They couldn't have just popped into existence. And so he recognizes that the truth of law of biogenesis applies to the whole universe, which remember is what Hawking said too. So he acknowledges that the biogenesis would still be in effect on the alien's home planet. And so he admits the problem of abiogenesis still hasn't been solved. Aliens aren't doing it. He's just moved the problem to their homeland where they have to deal with it. And the question of life, how it still has to be answered without resorting to abiogenesis. All right, so let's get this straight. According to evolutionists, the origin of life through spontaneous generation, which is necessary for evolution. It's impossible. The best they can do is try to dodge the issue or make up imaginary aliens to explain how life could get here. And you can't blame them. I mean, what else are you left with? A miracle? It is ironic that many evolutionists are now using terminology like that to describe the origin of life. Notice, for example, what Robert Jastrow said. At present, Science has no satisfactory answer to the question of the origin of life on the earth. Perhaps the appearance of life on the earth is a miracle. Scientists are reluctant to accept this view, but their choices are limited. Abiogenesis is also an act of faith. I would say blind faith, and here's why. The act of faith consists in assuming that the scientific view of the origin of life is correct without having what? Concrete evidence to support that belief. All right, so again, he's using faith there in a denominational sense. He's talking about pure blind faith that's not based on evidence. It's amazing that some of the more honest ones at least are coming out and, and grappling with this issue. They're beginning to equate evolution with religion. It's a supernatural idea just like all others. There is no such thing as a pure naturalist. The question is which supernatural model is the right one? That's the question. Evolutionist and Nobel Prize winner Sir Francis Crick. This is the guy that co-discovered the double helix structure of the DNA molecule. He acknowledged, if you're honest, an honest man, armed with all the knowledge available to us now, could only state that in some sense the origin of life appears at the moment to be almost a miracle. I mean, so many are the conditions which would have had to have been satisfied to get it along. Uh, uh, Kirkut that I um, uh, quoted from earlier, he said, spontaneous generation is a matter of faith on the part of the biologist, blind faith, because the evidence for what did happen is not available. All right, now, of course, really, what Dawkins and Davies and others, when they say things like that, oh, it's a miracle, we don't have a clue how it could happen, nobody does. Really, what they mean is no naturalist has a clue. Biblical supernaturalists, we know exactly how life got here, and it's not a problem. It's in perfect harmony with the law of biogenesis. So following the evidence, if the evidence indicates that in nature, 
without exception, life comes only from other similar life then logically the only way to be consistent with the evidence is to realize there must be something that is not natural, something outside of nature to explain the origin of life. That's the only option that's in harmony with the evidence. And of course the biblical model says that's exactly what is the case. How did living beings come to be? Well, by a supernatural being, bringing it into existence. Jehovah created life. He created living creatures. Life didn't spring into existence from nothing. God breathed life into man when he created him. It's God who gives to all life, breath, and all things, Acts 17, 25. He gives life to all things, 1 Timothy 6, 13. So the creation model is in harmony with the scientific evidence. The naturalistic model is unscientific. Now another implication, remember, is the second half of the law of biogenesis. Rudolf Fricall illustrated this in his uh, idea, in his uh, studies, the idea that not only does life come from life, but it comes from life of its kind, okay? Similar life. Uh, the McGraw-Hill Dictionary of Scientific and Technical Terms actually defines biogenesis, development of a living organism from a similar living organism, all right? Uh, one popular life science textbook put it this way, another characteristic of an organism, organisms is the ability to reproduce or produce offspring that are similar to the parents. For example, robins lay eggs that develop into young rhinoceroses that closely resemble their parents. No, that doesn't happen. Robins make robins, and there may be small differences in color and height and beak size and so forth, microevolution that can be shown to be able to occur, but even though there's changes, the offspring is still a robin. It's not a rhino, a whale. Macroevolution hasn't happened. So in nature, life comes only from life of its own kind. Dogs don't have cats, horses don't have cows, dinosaurs don't turn into birds, apes don't give rise to humans. But if evolution is true, then that is in essence what happened. Simple lower life sprang into existence, and from it, over eons of time, complex life came about. And so according to evolution, life does not come from life of its kind. It actually comes from other kinds in contradiction, once again, to the available evidence. In the field of philosophy, there's a law known as the law of excluded middle, and this law says that every precisely stated proposition is either true or false. There's no middle ground. So as long as you pre precisely and clearly define what you're talking about, you can know whether something is true or false. So if I say, Bill is bald, as long as I precisely define what a bald person is. Let's say I define it as a person with 100 hairs or less on his head. Okay, then I can know if Bill is or is not bald. Now, as long as I precisely define what a human is, and scientists have done that, then everything either is human or is not human. There's no middle ground. And according to law of biogenesis, a non-human doesn't give rise to a human. And so again, the evolutionary model requires that and it contradicts the evidence and logic. Evolutionary theory is not in harmony with the evidence. The biblical model, once again, is in perfect harmony with the evidence. God created life, created it according to its kind, told the earth to reproduce living things according to their kind. Whatever a man sows, that he will also reap, Galatians 6, 7. He's not going to reap something completely different from what he sowed. The biblical model doesn't have this problem of having to make evolutionary jumps between various kinds of life. God created life according to its kind, and those kinds have remained constant since creation with only small variations occurring. And that idea, the idea that life comes only from life of its own kind, leads us into another area, which we'll discuss somewhat briefly, go into this much more in depth in the book. And that is the idea of uh, genetics and mutation and how that plays a role in this whole discussion. You know, Darwin's evolution it has itself evolved over the decades, ironically, uh, since evolutionists have, keep having to admit, okay, life doesn't work in the way we thought it could. So they have to keep tweaking it, just like the Big Bang guys are doing. The evolutionary uh, timeline has constantly changed. Dates change as to when various animals lived. Uh, the order of evolutionary development has changed. The common ancestry has changed. New theories about why various animals develop their various body parts and so forth constantly being made because it's all just being made up anyway. 
In fact, evolution itself didn't originate with Charles Darwin. There's been forms of evolution for millennia. And for millennia, those ideas have had to be revamped to stay in keeping with the latest scientific evidence. Now, Darwin came along at the right time in history for evolutionary theory to, to become popular in the world. And so he's typically credited with coming up with it, but it really didn't start with him. Now, a fundamental component of his version of the theory was natural selection. Natural selection is the idea that whatever species are most fit or suited to a particular environment for survival, well, they're gonna to tend to survive. And those species that aren't as well suited, if they don't migrate, they're gonna to tend to die out. They're gonna get pushed out. And that's by and large true. And the creationist doesn't have a problem with that idea. The problem is that Darwin believed that natural selection would provide the mechanism for a single-celled organism to turn into all the kinds of species on the planet that this less complex life could turn into all other forms of life. Now scientists have realized now, Darwin was wrong about that. Natural selection alone can't cause evolution to occur. Notice what Stephen Jay Gould of Harvard said, the essence of Darwinism lies in a single phrase. Natural selection is the creative force of evolutionary change. No one denies that selection will play a negative role in eliminating the unfit. Darwinian theories require that it create the fit as well, and therein lies the problem. Evolutionists recognize they can't claim that natural selection could create the fit because it only filters from creatures that already exist. Dutch evolutionary botanist Hugo de Vries long ago said, natural selection may explain the survival of the fittest, but it cannot explain the arrival of the fittest. And so they now know natural selection can't cut it. Evolutionists will sometimes point to peppered moths. These will be in the textbooks and so forth and use this as proof that evolution happens. And the story is told that uh, two types of English peppered moths lived in England during the Industrial Revolution and most of the moths were light colored and speckled, which was said to allow them to be camouflaged when they were on trees uh, that had uh, light colored lichens covering them so the birds didn't notice them and didn't need as many of them. And then the factories in England began producing soot and smoke, which killed the lichens and started exposing the bark color underneath. And so then the light colored moths started dying out and the darker colored moths began thriving. And this was touted as proof of evolution. Now the whole story has been called into question as having been made up with fake photos taken and dead moths glued onto trees and so forth to prove their story. But even if it's true, this is just an example of natural selection. This is an evolution, one type of moth both moths already existed. One of them thrived in a certain kind of setting, and then they died out when the setting changed, and this other one started thriving. So you just have selection. You don't have a new creature coming about. In order for evolution to happen, you have to have actual change into another creature. Well, in biology textbooks, evolutionists will often point to Darwin's finches as proof that change can happen, that Darwin's evolution is true. So when traveling to various islands of the Galapagos, uh, Darwin noticed similar birds on various islands, similar but different, uh, differences, small differences, that, uh, that, but they were still finches among the differences he was saying, and he postulated that they may all be related and that various similar species evolved from a single ancestor there in South America. And so from that he inferred, well, hey, all life could have maybe happened in that same way from common ancestors. Well, it very well may be that the various types of finches did in fact come from a common ancestor, maybe even in South America. But notice they're still acknowledged to be finches. Small changes have occurred within the finch kind, what we call again microevolution, but macroevolution has never been demonstrated to be able to occur. And that's the kind of evidence they need to prove Darwinian, Darwinian evolution was right. Notice what Miller and Levine admitted in their textbook. They discussed the, the recent work of Peter and uh, Rosemary Grant of Princeton. They spent 35 years studying the Galapagos finches. And the Grants realized that Darwin's theory about finch evolution was based on assumptions, the first being, for beak size and shape to evolve, there must be enough heritable variation in those traits to provide raw material for natural selection, all right? So think about that. What that means is if the finch didn't already have the genetic uh, 
potential in its genes for making various big sizes and shapes that could be inherited, then it couldn't evolve those differences. Those differences had to already exist in the finch's genes. So if the finch didn't have the potential for growing something different than, say, a beak, it's not going to be able to grow it. There's, in other words, there's limits to how much a finch can change. A finch may have a baby that's slightly different than its parent, but it has, uh, because it has the potential for some genetic variety, so we're not exactly the same as our parents, but it's still a finch. And after the new finch is born, okay, now natural selection jumps in. And basically, if that particular variety of finch is better suited to its environment, it's going to tend to do better. Okay, that's all. There's been no evolution between kinds of creatures. Well, evolutionists have realized this over the last century, all right, that the natural selection can't be used to prove one type of creature can evolve into a totally different kind. Enter neo-Darwinism. This is the idea that natural selection coupled with genetic mutation, so DNA accidents, that will give you a mechanism for change. All right, so if a creature has another creature and it's mutated a little bit, okay, then now you've got something that's you know, more significantly different from the original creature. Well, again, we can go look at the actual physical evidence and test that to see whether that really is how this goes down. And what we find is this, this claim has problems too because genetic mutations, when we look at how, how this happens, they don't create, again, this new raw material uh, or new genetic information, which is what you need if evolution is true. Notice what Alan Hayward said about this, a British engineer and physicist. He said, mutations, right, when we look at the evidence, they do not appear to bring progressive changes. Genes seem to be built so as to allow changes to occur within certain narrow boundaries or narrow limits and to prevent those limits from being crossed. To oversimplify a little, mutations very easily produce new varieties within a species and might occasionally produce a new, though similar species. But despite enormous efforts by experimenters and breeders, mutations seem unable to produce entirely new forms of life. And so they'll do this with fruit flies and so forth, intentionally try to make them mutate, and they still have not been able to make new creatures by doing that. Stephen Jay Gould, concerning mutations, he said, a mutation doesn't produce major new raw material. You don't make a new species by mutating the species. That's a common idea people have, that evolution is due to random mutations. A mutation is not the cause of evolutionary change. When you go look at the actual data, it doesn't, mutations don't do that. Now, when he says mutations don't produce major new raw material, that's an important concept. New raw material, the new stuff to make you turn into something totally different, which is based on new genetic information. That is not added to the genome in a mutation. So let's, th let's think about information for a moment. If I were to give you a physical book, what would I be giving you in a purely physical sense? Well, I'd be giving you leather or cloth, which is your cover, paper, which is basically wood, some kind of glue, ink, maybe a little dust. Physically, that's what I'm giving you. Now, I can arrange the ink in a certain way without actually adding anything physically to the book, and I can thereby give some meaning to those materials. I can convey a message, though again, I haven't actually added anything physically, any molecules to the book. And yet clearly I have added something to the physical book, even though it's not a physical addition, right? Information, information can be added and it doesn't even have to be on paper, right? We can convey information by, by vibrating airwaves like I'm doing right now in your direction. A Morse code where you're just tapping on things. Smoke signals, can, you know, so we can convey information in all different kinds of ways, but in none of these is there anything about the physical motions or sounds themselves that inherently means anything or is anything in and of itself, physically speaking. We assign meaning to those physical actions or sounds, but if we didn't, then they wouldn't have any meaning inherently. There's nothing that's been physically added. So information is not physical, but it clearly exists. Information scientist, professor, and control engineer Werner Gitt, uh, who's retired director of the Information Technology Division at the German Federal Institute of Physics and Technology, he said, many scientists therefore justly regard information as the third fundamental entity alongside matter and energy. So information is real. 
In fact, we know biologically it's packed into our DNA and makes it what we are physically. It controls what we ultimately become. You know, think about the printing of a book or even the copying of a book file electronically. Have you ever made a copy? Maybe you put a, um, put a, 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 a file on a USB, like a flash drive, and then when you opened it, it was it messed up. Like something happened in the copying of the file. Well, that's like a mutation. These are errors that will sometimes turn up. And so individual words might be messed up. A few letters could be changed to other letters. These in genetics are code, called codon errors. Uh, duplication can occur, which is the idea that words, sentences, even entire paragraphs could be duplicated in the book somewhere. And this also is a kind of genetic mutation. Translocation can occur, which is the idea that chunks from one part of the book could be moved from one area of the book and inserted into another area. Deletion, which is the idea that chunks of the book are just lost. And so these kinds of errors or mutations can occur, and there's others. But notice that no new material is written when these errors or mutations occur. A new sentence hasn't been written into the story, has it? See, the problem is that the theory of evolution requires new sentences and even chapters to have been written into the genetic book on accident. It's like the apes trying to, to create Shakespeare with, with scissors and magazines. In fact, evolution requires sequels of the book to then write themselves into existence. So codon errors, duplications, translocation, deletions, these are mutations, but mutations don't add new genetic information. They simply garble something that already exists. You know, they alter what's already there. So they might cause a fly to end up with extra wings, like in homeotic mutations, or a person to end up with an extra toe, like in polydactyly. But mutations can't create a new kind of creature. A mutation wouldn't cause, for example, a wing to appear on a creature unless the creature already had wings in its genetic code. In other words, if it, ha it has to have that inherited variabil variability, the heritable variability that they were talking about, the grants were talking about out there in the Galapagos. In other words, using our book example, no new paragraphs or chapters can be written by mutations when you look at the actual evidence. And what that means is if a living entity doesn't already have the genetic code to grow a new part, it can't grow it. Sorry, if you don't have antlers in your genes, you're just not going to be able to grow them, as cool as that might be. If you don't have webbed duck feet uh, or feathers in your genes, you're not going to be able to grow those. If you don't have tank tracks in your genes, you're just not going to be able to roll on over to your neighbor's house and carry out a tank assault. And it really doesn't matter how long you live and how much you mutate, according to the evidence. You can believe that, but you'll be believing it blindly. Now, what about bacteria? that have evolved a resistance to antibiotics through mutation. You heard about this? This is an example some people will point to, and they, they're now using it with COVID, and we already wrote an article responding to that. First of all, notice that such changes in bacteria didn't lead to the bacteria to be something else. It's still bacteria. So again, this would be a microevolutionary change. This isn't a macro, this isn't a Darwinian change. So to take that kind of example and blindly jump to the, to the conclusion, therefore, a, a simple single-celled organism can turn into a human, okay, now that's a jump beyond the evidence. But also notice that the antibiotics didn't trigger the mutations, as though antibiotics um, were present, and so the bacteria responded to the antibiotics intentionally and changed themselves so that they could survive, as though they intentionally adapted to the antibiotics. Sometimes that's how evolution is portrayed. A horse straining his neck trying to reach the leaves and so eventually turns into a giraffe, right? That's how uh, they used to argue for evolution years ago. No, the mutations caused bacteria to change before the antibiotics even existed. Then those bacteria that had helpful mutations stuck around due to natural selection. And also note that these mutations didn't add information to the genome. They were accidental mistakes that happened to help the bacteria survive, very rare scenario. They adjusted previously existing material. So evolution from a single-celled organism to a human requires the addition of a lot of information. So here's an illustration that highlights why these mutations aren't really helping the species. Really what you have is de-evolution. Let's say a bacteria had a right and a left arm. 
And when an antibiotic was used, it killed the bacteria by attaching itself to the left hand. Okay, so that was the antibiotic's mode of attack through the left arm. All right, now what would happen if a bacteria randomly mutated where it didn't have a left arm? Okay, the antibiotic's not going to be able to kill it. It's going to survive. Now, is the bacteria really better off? Okay, it can survive an attack by that particular antibiotic, yeah, but overall it's a weaker species. It's crippled. It hasn't evolved into anything else. It really hasn't caused a net improvement in the species as evolution requires. Instead, what we see is genetic entropy. The second law of thermodynamics is still occurring. It's going, we're going downward. You have a loss of genetic information here. Now, wait a minute, somebody says, but mutations, if they don't add material to the genome, then what about duplications, gene duplications? Those kind of mutations, they add material. So duplications are, are mutations that duplicate nucleotides or chromosomes, and in that sense, they do add two times the same information to the genome in those areas where they occur. But notice, notice what duplications do. Try reading the screen. A duplication of material doesn't add new, new information, right? It just repeats already existing information. It's not new information. And if anything, those mutations tend to create chaos. The bulk of the examples, that's what's going on. Entropy and degeneration and disruption of the genome that ultimately ends up getting eliminated uh, because that's the way God made it. The things that are not right will tend to, to die out, to break. This is not evolutionary progress. Neo-Darwinism and its reliance on mutation simply doesn't give you a mechanism for cell to human evolution, as so many evolutionists are now accepting. That's why evolutionist Paul, Pierre, uh, Pierre Paul Grasset, who was the chair of evolution at the Sorbonne in Paris for over 30 years, he said, no matter how numerous they may be, mutations do not produce any kind of evolution, all right? So when you look at the actual evidence, that's what you got. Lynn Margolis and Dorian uh, Sagan came out strongly expressing their disagreement with the idea that genetic mutations could be the mechanism for evolution. They said mutation accumulation does not lead to new species or even to new organs or tissues. So evolution contends life started as a single cell and then over millions of years has resulted in the human race. Uh, Neo-Darwinism theorizes that mutations can, can allow that kind of change. But in reality, that kind of evolution requires the addition of libraries upon libraries of genetic information into the genetic code, and mutations don't provide that. There is not even a mechanism to make a single-celled organism turn into a human, and yet the evolutionists still must accept that to have happened. This book, Genetic Entropy, this is not a, um, an AP book, this, but I recommend it anyway. Um, this guy, Sanford, is a population geneticist. He actually is the inventor of the gene gun, and he deals a decisive blow to this idea of um, neo-Darwinism, uh, just, just nails it, a decisive blow to that subject. Check that out if you are interested. I think I've got one copy of it back there you can purchase. So the science that we've looked at now in these first three sessions, which is the equivalent to mounds upon mounds of scientific evidence, totally dismantles four of the fundamental planks of evolutionary theory. So recall this chart. Yesterday we saw the laws of thermodynamics and the law of causality pro prohibit the first two planks. The universe could not have created itself or be uh, eternal, and life requires a cause. Now that evidence alone, remember, is enough to destroy the entire idea of evolution. And yet there's more. Remember the creation models in harmony with these laws? Uh, the laws of probability add further weight to the fact that those planks are not in harmony with the evidence and yet support the creationist contention that the universe came from God. The law of biogenesis further illustrates that abiogenesis cannot occur and neither can macroevolution because life produces according to its kind, not what macroevolution would say. And again, the creation model is in harmony with that evidence as well. And now the evidence from genetics illustrates that macroevolution can't happen. Uh, Neo-Darwinism, which is the a mechanism for macroevolutionary change that they argue for is false because mutations uh, don't provide new genetic information. Once again, the creation model has no problem with that evidence since the nature of genetic mutation and the creation model harmonize with each other. Uh, the creation model doesn't have to rely on neo-Darwinism to explain the existence of, of creatures. Uh, 
because according to the creation model, God created all creatures according to their kind. The laws of science are written by God, and so of course you would expect them to be in harmony with the biblical creation model. And yet when we study the evidence, the evolutionary model is riddled with major issues. A few years ago, Philip Yam wrote about new ideas that get brought up in the scientific community that contradict already proven science. And he said, certainly there should be room for far out potentially revolutionary ideas, but not at the expense of solid science. Now what a telling statement, because what can be more solid science than the laws of science? And what theory comes more in conflict with solid science than naturalistic evolution? You know, it really it's a mystery to me as to why evolution can even be deemed a scientific theory because it doesn't even have supporting evidence for several of its most fundamental planks. If upon gathering scientific evidence, a person continues to find constant contradiction with a theory and finds that there seems to be a never ending readjustment of a theory to try to keep up with the latest evidence. At some point, a person should, if he's being logical, sensible, rational, he should consider maybe this theory is just not right and we need to start over. Wouldn't that be logical? Wouldn't that be scientific and unbiased, unprejudiced? Shouldn't a person be pretty suspicious of any theory that has to be continually revamped over and over and over throughout centuries and even millennia in order to keep it alive? All right. Um, so much more we could talk about this. Again, I deal with a lot of the quibbles that people would bring up in response to these things in the Science First Evolution book. And I think I'm already almost out of those. I should have brought more of them. Uh, but you can get copies of that on our website if, we, if I do run out. All right, in our next sessions, we'll start looking at some of the specific evidences that they bring up to try to uh, provide support for Darwinian evolution. All right, uh, Dylan, where'd you go? Show me to turn them loose. All right, let's, uh, so we'll start back at 10.30. Thank you for your attention.